Interview and job search strategies that work. Recently, I read an article on uh, gregsavage.com slash or dot au, and I'll put the link to the article in the show notes. It makes a really good sense, actually, on it, and I'll just preface uh, some of the things he talks about in the article in case uh, some of you don't want to click on the link. Um, anyway, one is um, it talks about recruiters, right, and so how recruiters can – can change in this new era, right? And the title of the the blog or the title of the post is called 12 Massive Blunders Most Recruiters Are Making Right Now. It's from uh, November 29th of 2016. Some of them actually are are relevant today. And uh, I'll go through a couple of them, right? The first one is recruiters lie too much on job boards uh, for the candidates basically. Everybody's been in a situation where you, you, you're you posting on a job board and you think you're the right candidate for this job, but you never get a call back. It's because you don't have like a degree or some type of skill set. Maybe it's like five years experience, but you only have three years experience in some field. Like it doesn't really matter, actually. So that's why recruiters probably... Uh, don't see you because they see, oh, you don't meet the five years. So their algorithm in their job search or whatever doesn't show you uh, as a candidate. The second one is that recruiters, when they basically talk talk down to candidates, basically. It's, it's almost like you're talking to, for instance, IT, right? You're talking to a non-IT person, and if they don't understand or well, firstly, you, you, it's your job as a candidate to make them understand or to help them understand what your skills are. It's like, okay, my job is IT. It's like this or like that. Just make analogies for them. That really helped it along, by the way, right there. And the other side of that, a recruiter, you know, you're, you're not looking for the diamond, right? You, a lot of times you're looking for that, that, that diamond in the rough. You know, you have to dig out in the dirt or the coal, basically, to find that diamond, if you will. Or another analogy could be you have to sift through a lot of dirt and a rubble to find gold. And it goes a long way if, if you empathize with the candidate, such as tell me about your experience, give me an idea. You know, what is it like? If you ask the candidate something like, what is that skill like? Can you give me a, an idea? Something like, you know, if I was a candidate, I would say something like, okay, what do you do? Oh, I do storage. What does that mean exactly, right? The candidate may ask, or the recruiter may ask. And you could say, for example, oh, do you know Facebook, right? And you save your files and your pictures on your profile somewhere. Well, that's a, a piece, that's a storage device. And that's what I do. I make sure that works properly. So they, the, the, can, the recruiter understands has a visual representation of, oh, that's what you do. And all that jargon that you have in resume means something to them. They have like an emotional attachment to it, basically, because they have experienced Facebook, perhaps, when they've had to delete a, delete a file or they didn't save a picture and it's not there. So they have, oh, okay, I had to save that somewhere so I understand it now. Probably what would ha help candidates is if they, when they are sourcing a person, look, look, try to find them in Google. Try to find what they look like. Try to do a little background research on them a little bit. Because you may be talking to a great candidate, but that candidate may be an introvert. Maybe have a lot of skills, but they're an introvert, so they don't know how to talk to a recruiter, or they just know how, okay, one word answers. You know, it, it's really sometimes... If you want that good candidate, ask them those pertinent questions. Ask them, just ask them about what they do. Change your tone, lower your tone a bit, make it more like a conversation with your friend versus I'm a recruiter and I'm trying to be a robot and I'm trying to disqualify you from this job so I can move on to the next person. You know, they have like maybe 20 or 30 people and they want to get through them. Okay, I want to get to all these 20 or 30 people so that I can go to lunch or I can finish up this job wreck so I can get it filled. Well, if you spend a whole day talking to 20 or 30 people, 
rather than spending you know 10 minutes or five minutes each person essentially an hour what you're going to do is you're going to learn more about them and you're going to create a mini network so for instance even if they're not qualified you let them know hey i don't think you're qualified for the position however i do see some skills there that me based on being a recruiter i think um, you could work on basically you're letting them know you're not qualified for this but here's how i think you can get that try to connect with them on facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. The other one talks about, the third one, right, talks about building a, bit, a digital brand. You're a recruiter and you don't post anything on your, like Twitter, hey, I have a job. Some, some places do. LinkedIn's a good example. Twitter is a good example. I know some companies have like a, uh, an agreement or some sort of NDA probably that you can't post jobs unless it comes from this site, the company site. So I get that. The other one that talks about is you've probably been in this situation before where a company calls you and let's say the job is, is Chicago. A Chicago recruiter will call you and say, okay, I have this position for you and it's, it pays like $50 an hour, let's just say. And you say, oh, great. You know, and you're thinking, okay, that person, okay, good, awesome. Obviously, they're in the same city, so they must have an in for that job, so to speak. Not more than... I don't know, an hour later, someone from New Jersey or Georgia calls you and says, oh, I have a rec for this job. And it's the same one in Georgia. And what they say is, okay, the billable rate is $60 an hour. So I can bill you at $60 an hour or $70 an hour for that, for that job. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah. I mean, this is on, sometimes is on the, the person as well, the, the, the person looking for the job. They should really recognize, the chances are, that person in Georgia or the person in Jersey isn't going to have really an end to that job. Or the likelihood is the person from Chicago is going to have more of a, a connection with them because they can just probably go to their location once a week or something like that. But those people from those recruiters from those other states who are not in the, who are not local, you know, you're doing a disservice to the, to the person actually looking for a job. You know, you, you probably know there's no chance he or she is going to get the job. Okay, let's just send it anyway. I want to get my numbers up. You know, because it's, there's a chance. You know, maybe it's one out of 100 or one out of whatever. Most of the time when you do those type of techniques, somebody that's just looking for a job or they're desperate for a job, they're going to take that. But it's kind of a false hope sometimes, basically. But again, that's probably on the more the person looking for a job than it is looking, you know, who the person actually has the, who's the recruiter, because you you as a person looking for a job have to do their due diligence. And the other one is looking at the client face to face or on Skype. Some companies do this. AirTech's pretty good at it. Uh, like they'll meet you and buy you uh, lunch or something like that. Uh, tech systems, excuse me. Maybe the person, the recruiter, if they don't ask you as the person looking for the job, hey, do you want to do a Skype? Maybe introduce it to them and see what they say. The other one, which is not actually on here, is something I would add, actually, is when you, you have a resume on the job board, Dice, Career Builder, Zip Recruiter, Job Serve, Indeed, Monster. You ask the candidate for their, their resume. And you can negate that by just asking them, that resume on whatever job board is, is that the most accurate? The candidate says yes. Don't ask him for a resume again. <laughs> don't ask him, can you send me an updated copy of resume? The recruiter, you as the recruiter, you don't know what their situation is like. They could be at work on their lunch break. They're on their phone. They don't have their resume, so they have to find it somewhere on their phone during lunch. And then they email it to you as a recruiter. What do you do? You email them back and you say like, oh, it's not in this format. Do you, as a recruiter, do you have the tools? Do you have Word or Open Office? Can you just do it yourself? Because you keep emailing the recruiter, or the, sorry, you keep emailing the candidate saying, hey, send, you know, can you send me this or whatever? Most of the time it's all for nothing. You're just trying to get numbers. You're just trying to, you know, that person's not qualified. You just want to hurry up and, and, and get the person posted to the company. That way you can make that dollar. 
Which is what it's about, actually, by the way. I mean, don't get me wrong. That's what it's about. People, people remember that, really, by the way. Just so you know, people that... When they, when they, if they've dealt with you before or your company, they'll see that company like, oh, no, I'm probably not going to get that job. So I'm not even going to respond to that email or whatever. So your email goes to junk, junk mail, or you don't get an email. So because you've done those practices, you lost out on a candidate. More importantly, you've lost out on his or her friends because they're not going to recommend you as a recruiting company because of what, you know, you've asked a bunch of questions and you... You've asked, um, really, you're not doing your due diligence, basically. And again, it's not the recruiter's job to make the resume updated or to get the updated resume or to change it to PDF. But if you go the extra mile, it means a lot for the person looking for a job. Another thing I'll add on here is culture. It doesn't really get talked about in from a recruiter standpoint, but if a recruiter ever told the candidate, okay, this is what their culture is like, and give examples. Make it sound awesome. If it's an IBM uh, place and they're not work from home at all, I'm sure you can find some good things about it to talk about. And then also let the candidates know, oh, this person really understands the, the client, the company. They just don't have dinner or lunch with the their accounts manager, just doesn't have dinner or lunch with the hiring manager, and, and that's it. They actually understand uh, what they're looking for in an employee. Try to be transparent with the candidate as well. If, for instance, you know the salary range for a certain area, give them a little tips like, okay, go to salary.com and look up this, this job title, and you're going to see what the range is in that area. And you're going to know that what we're paying is very comparable to that, that rate. You're just making it more personable to the person looking for a job. I will say this. If you're a recruiting company out there, and you want to make a bunch of money, only deal with work-from-home jobs. That's it. Find companies out there who want to have only work-from-home jobs or only want people that work from home. And take your low, your normal 20% or whatever you have and knock it down to like 5 or 6% with some sort of incentives. It's a low and wide strategy, basically. Of course, you're probably going to have to get rid of that uh, big building that you're in and probably trans translate or rather trans mo actually move your employees to more of a work from home like a work from home recruiter because how can you find a job for people that work from home when you yourself don't work from home so that's probably more for uh, coming up companies coming up uh, new establishing recruiting companies because i don't think large ones like kelly mitchell or tech systems i don't think they can do that they they're so they have offices that they pay money for. So for them to transition to a work-from-home recruiting agency is going to be very difficult for them to do. Okay, I'd like to thank you for viewing this, listening to this podcast, and have a great day.